Hello, everyone, and welcome back to History of Medicine. Hope you're all doing well. This week, we're going to travel to Africa, a place we have not visited yet, to talk about the relationship between Western ethnomedicine and the continent's indigenous medical systems. Our specific focus is going to be on South Africa in the 20th and 21st century, and our chief goal is to explore this thing called traditional medicine. This is a term you've probably heard of before, and if you've thought about it, you might be wondering what exactly the term traditional means. Today, we hear a lot about things like traditional Chinese medicine. You might have also heard people talk about Kazakh traditional medicine. This is a really popular label in the contemporary medical world, and among those places it's getting used, perhaps none are more noteworthy than South Africa, where traditional medicine is big business. The industry received a big boost in 2004 when the South African Parliament introduced a bill to formally recognize traditional healers and to create a system for granting them official medical licenses. The bill created what was called the Interim Traditional Health Practitioners Council, whose job was to, quote, provide for a regulatory framework to ensure the efficacy, safety, and quality of traditional health care practitioners. In terms of defining traditional health practices, the law stipulated that those were based on traditional philosophy, which itself was defined as, quote, indigenous African techniques, principles, theories, ideologies, beliefs, opinions, and customs, and uses of traditional medicines which are generally used in traditional health practice. Such a definition might seem straightforward, but one might legitimately ask, what exactly do the terms traditional and indigenous mean? What is traditional about traditional medicine? Often when we use this term, we do so to refer to things that we think are old, unchanging, and that are somehow authentic. We might also think of things like oral traditions, stories passed down through the generations that tell of past rulers or other famous, exciting historical figures. But are traditions really these things? Are they static, unchanging, or are they durable, adaptive, and dynamic? Perhaps one way to make some headway on these questions is to do a bit of word history. The word tradition in English itself is derived from the Latin tradere, which means to hand over or to deliver. In ancient times, tradition referred to the handing down of knowledge or the passing on of a doctrine. But only some things are worthy of being handed down, so over time, tradition came to be associated with matters of authority, right, duty, and respect. Whereas originally tradition referred to the act of knowledge transmission, eventually it came to refer to the thing itself that was being transmitted. Thus, it came to be seen as something static and was associated with customs and beliefs, particularly of a religious kind. Much later on in European history, when Enlightenment philosophers criticized attachment to tradition, this is what they were talking about about religious authority grounded in custom, which, according to them, prevented people from seeing the world as it actually is. Thus, in the West, tradition came to be seen as a negative force that was the enemy of science and rational thought and empiricism. Later on still, around the turn of the 20th century, Max Weber wrote about tradition as something that would be overcome by the progressive forces of modernity. For Weber, modernity is all about constant innovation, and as such, it is the enemy of tradition. These understandings of tradition persisted until the late 20th century, when a number of Western scholars began to conceive of this term in a radically new way. Especially key here was the work of two British historians, Eric Hobsbawm and Terence Ranger. In 18, 
1983, the two of them published an edited volume called The Invention of Tradition, and it turned the accepted wisdom on its head. In this book, Hobsbawm and Ranger argue that instead of being opposed to modernity, traditions are actually the creation of modernity. In their book, which is essentially a series of historical case studies, Hobsbawm and Ranger look at how the modernizing states of the late 19th and early 20th century in Europe actively created traditions in order to build social cohesion within the continent's newly emerging national communities. This was done mainly to increase the power and legitimacy of the state. Hobsbawm and Ranger defined invented traditions as, quote, a set of practices normally governed by overtly or tacitly accepted rules and of a ritual or symbolic nature, which seek to inculcate certain values and norms of behavior by repetition, which automatically implies continuity with the past. They can refer to both traditions actually invented, constructed, and formally instituted, and those emerging in a less easily traceable manner within a brief and debatable period, a matter of a few years perhaps, and establishing themselves with great rapidity. Thus, as these two historians put it, traditions were responses to novel situations, which take the form of reference to old situations, or which establish their own past by quasi-obligatory repetition. None of this should be taken to mean that there are no such things as actual traditions. In their book, Hobsbawm and Ranger acknowledge the existence of what they call genuine traditions. Referring to these, they write that, quote, where the old ways are alive, tradition need neither be revived nor invented. But they're not interested in these genuine traditions. They're calling attention to cases wherein social, cultural, or political authorities build imaginary links between the past and the present-day rituals, ceremonies, and practices they're creating so as to build community and stability and legitimacy. These are what we might call inauthentic traditions, although we have to be careful with this word because is anything really authentic? In order to help us make sense of all of this counterintuitive understanding of tradition, let me give you one example from Hobbes, Bum, and Ranger's book. The first chapter of the book, after the introduction that is, is by Hugh Trevor Roper, and it's about the Highland tradition of Scotland. The piece is a bit of fashion history. It talks about the outfit that has come to be referred to as Scottish national dress, a kilt woven in tartan whose color and pattern indicate the wearer's clan. Today, whenever Scottish people gather together to celebrate their national identity, they wear this garb, and many regard it as one of the most ancient traditions of Scotland. The tartan kilt is seen as something that has served as the national dress since time immemorial, as something that goes as far back as tradition reaches. But, as Trevor Roper shows, it doesn't. For most of their history, his research indicates, Scottish people, including those of the Highlands, covered their bodies with two basic items of clothing, a long saffron-dyed shirt known in Gaelic as the line shirt, and a form of pants known as trues, which were a kind of combination of breeches and stockings. The shirt originated in Ireland, which is not surprising because from the 5th through the 18th centuries, the western part of Scotland was basically a colony and a cultural dependency of Ireland. So, if not an ancient garb, when was the kilt actually invented? Interestingly, it was created not by Scots themselves, but by an Englishman, a Quaker businessman named Thomas Rawlinson. In 1727, Rawlinson who was looking to expand his business into Scotland, made a deal with a family in the northern part of that country near the city of Inverness. During his time in Scotland, Rawlinson noticed that the clothing of his Scottish factory workers was cumbersome and unwieldy. As such, he set out to amend their customary dress and to make it more convenient for the kind of labor they had to do in his factories. 
The result of his efforts was something called the small kilt, the exact same piece of clothing that many Scots today claim as their traditional attire. As this makes clear, the kilt is a modern costume. It was developed by an English industrialist not to preserve the culture of the Scottish Highlands, but to assimilate that culture to the demands of the modern English industrial factory. But then you may be wondering, how did this modern English invention get misremembered as an ancient Scottish tradition? The key period here is the 18th century, which was quite a tumultuous time in Scottish history. In 1707, Scotland and England signed an agreement to merge into a single country, Great Britain. The union of these two countries came about largely because of English military hostility, and during the 18th century, English armies undertook various campaigns to pacify and forcibly assimilate the Scots, particularly those in the Western Highlands, to their own ways of life. Rawlinson's kilt was but one part of this general assimilation campaign. Another part was the creation of the Highland Regiments, British military units that fought for the newly combined countries and that would henceforth be dedicated to imperial wars and the UK's conquest of peoples all across the Americas, Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. Shortly after these regiments were formed, they were given a distinct form of clothing, the kilt. This decision only made Rawlinson's sartorial invention more popular, and eventually, Scottish civilians all across the country, even outside the Highlands, began wearing it. In the 1770s, a London-based organization called the Highland Society popularized the kilt even more and began spreading the idea that this was in fact the dress of Scotland's Celtic ancestors. Notably, some Scottish writers resisted this idea, and they pointed out that trousers and Irish long shirts were far more ancient than the tartan kilt. But these voices were drowned out by those looking to promote a sense of Scottish national distinction at a time in which Scottish identity and distinctiveness was believed to be threatened by unity with England. And ever since, the myth of the tartan kilt as a relic of the ancient Celtic highlands has been perpetuated down through the ages. This is what we mean when we say invented tradition. As I mentioned, the release of Hobsbawm and Ranger's book in 1983 was a path-breaking moment in terms of English language understandings of tradition as a concept. The Invention of Tradition was an incredibly influential book, and after 1983, the discovery and analysis of invented traditions became a preoccupation of scholars within the social sciences and humanities, as in field after field, researchers started paying attention to how societies and governments employ the past to make the present. As you can see here from the screenshots on the slide, invented traditions have been found all across this world, and they include such things as Shinto wedding ceremonies, the pizza margarita, the idea of gross national happiness, and martyrdom. As these studies have collectively revealed, tradition is something that usually gains importance during times of rapid social, economic, and political change. It thus becomes a means of asserting power over events that seem outside one's control. Invented traditions respond to fears that some kind of vital knowledge or custom is about to be lost and tries to fight against this possibility. New desires for authenticity often lead to the creation of new traditions. So to this point in the lecture, we haven't really talked much about medicine, diseases, doctors, or patients. That's something I want to open up to all of you now. Having learned a little bit about the idea of invented traditions, I want to ask you some questions. Particularly, is traditional medicine an invention or a genuine tradition? How might the concept of invented traditions be applied to the history of medicine? What are some possible examples of invented medical traditions? Let's pause and think about these things before moving on. I look forward to reading and commenting on your posts, and I'll see you all in the discussion forum.